you for joining us on the Dow Sports uh, video cast. I'm Troy Kirby, along with Greg Byrne, athletic director and social media aficionado. <laughs> You're one of the few people that actually understand in your status how to actually do good Twitter. And I don't mean that as a joke as much as some people they really derive it as they're being a comedian on Twitter when they're an athletic director or they don't share anything at all. What right. are some kind of your thoughts? Well, I, I try to have a pretty simple approach to where am I interested in what I'm about ready to put out. Obviously, we're going to promote our teams. We're going to promote our student athletes in the University of Arizona. At the same time, too, um, you know, I, I put down on my, my Twitter description that uh, you know, I, I want to promote, engage, communicate, and have some fun. And, uh, and I try to do some real human interest things that uh, I find interesting. Yes, uh, in fact, Sunday morning, my wife and I were watching CBS this morning, and they had a great piece on uh, uh, a young man who, I think an eight-year-old boy, who found $20 in the parking lot at Cracker Barrel, and he, he decided he wanted to give it to a soldier who was in there having breakfast. And the story was incredible. I actually got choked up and had to, and I said on my tw tweet when I put it out there, you better get your cl at Kleenex ready. And uh, so it's simple things like that. This morning I, I challenged uh, or just did, did a great reminder that Dish Network has picked up now the SEC Network yesterday. They have the Pac-12 Networks. They have the Big Ten. And uh, you know, one of the competitors say they're the they're the uh, uh, ultimate sports provider or something along those lines, and they don't have any of those. So, or actually, I'm sorry, they have the Big Ten, but we're uh, we hope that can change. So we want to put pressure on that and have our fans be reminded of that. And uh, you just try to have some fun, and and I do all my own tweeting, and and uh, um, try to have a balance of not being overkill or just trying to sell tickets. Uh, but that's part of it, but also at the same time to engage in people and make them communicate. And I try to respond to some of our, our folks who t tweet at me as well. You've also had the headshot of Ron Swanson. You've kind of done something <laughs> that's a little out there, but not so much that it's embarrassing right. or it looks like something you're going to have to retract from. Do you ever uh, like have that tweet kind of up and then go, eh, and pull that back? Yeah, the only time I've really done that is when I've misspelled something. Sometimes I'm doing it quickly and I and R L U R O A R E and and uh, you know just without thinking I put one I put the wrong one down. I was like, oh gosh, I got to take that back. And as soon as I read it, uh, but but no, I, I haven't done a whole lot. Now one of the things we do with our student athletes is we talk to them all the time about social media responsibility. You can have fun, you can you can laugh at yourself and things like that, but language, pictures, things that are going to embarrass them, our program, our university, their family, and so we've warned them about it. And so uh, when they don't behave properly once a year when we have our all-student-athlete barbecue on that old video board right there, but uh, on the new one that you saw today, which is very nice, we put up people's tweets and uh, Facebook and Instagram uh, pictures and things that they've done that is not family friendly. And we want them to know there's consequences for their actions. And uh, that seems to, it's not perfect, but it seems to have worked because our number of incidents with inappropriate social media use by our student athletes has actually gone down quite a bit. You were also a harbinger of things to come. You actually tweeted out uh, your football coach, Rich Rodriguez, when he was hired. That was completely unorthodox because of the fact everyone was used to it coming on the normal newspaper, right. the columnists getting their shot at him first, and instead you kind of bypassed all of that. Was that something that actually allowed other athletic directors to breathe and go, hey, I really want to do that myself? Or was that still consternation on their behalf well, to say, ah? I've had pretty good feedback from my peers about it. And actually, the interesting thing about that, what happened there, that episode, was uh, we had our whole marketing plan put together for whoever our new football coach was going to be. We hired Rich, Rich Rodriguez, excuse me, and, uh, and my wife, Regina, and I are flying into Detroit to go pick up coach rodriguez and his family and bring him back to tucson for the press conference the next day and uh we're about ready to land in, in detroit and i said to regina i said hey i'm supposed to send a tweet out about who the new football coach is and when we had left tucson nobody knew but it, it had not a word had been uh, breathed about who was it, it was going to be so my wife's very creative and she said you know uh what if what if i take a picture of you and rich and you do a twit pick and say in the new arizona football coaches dot 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 and then they click on the picture. I said, God, that's great. So we're standing there and we're about ready to take the picture. And I could tell Coach Rodriguez's family, you know, they were kind of, they were excited too. So I said, hey, come on and get in the picture. And so it was all of us together. Regina did it with my phone. We sent it out. And as, I, I haven't looked at it for a long time, but the last time I did it, it that, that picture had been clicked on like 68,000 times 
felt like a Kardashian or something. And, uh, and then we had, uh, but then the ESPN wrote about it, the New York Times, Time Magazine, Newsweek, all wrote about this as, you know, what our world's becoming as far as how information and news is shared. And I talk about that when I speak to classes, because I always ask in classes, how many of you are, let's talk about social media here for a second. I spoke at a law school class yesterday, and I said, uh, how many of you use, have a Facebook page? Or I, I know now I'll say, how many of you don't have Facebook? And usually one or two kids don't have Facebook. And I'll engage with them a little bit on why they're using it. Not a lot of kids are actually using Facebook that much, though. It's interesting. Then, I, then I'll say, how many of you have Instagram? They all have Instagram. Then how many of you have Twitter? Usually about two-thirds of the class have, has Twitter. And I'll tell them, I'll say, listen, we're probably not going to hire somebody in marketing and sales and tickets if they aren't using social media because that's how you're going to c- communicate with our future fans. Second part about it is a couple summers ago when the governments of Libya and Egypt were overthrown, the rebel groups used Twitter to communicate. And so if it can overthrow a government, that's a, or be the communication uh, tool on that, it's a pretty powerful tool and you better figure it out. And so that's, so really I owe, I owe my use of Twitter uh, to Scott Strickland who replaced me at Mississippi State. Uh, he's the one that encouraged me to get involved with it. And now I've, I've had national writers, some are former newspaper people, and they'll tell me they're gonna read Twitter every morning before they read the newspaper. And so it's, it, it's a very powerful tool and, and it's something that I've embraced to try to have some fun with. How do you prevent breaking news when you're not even settled on, say, a contract or anything else? When negotiations or even if it's a student athlete's FERPA violation, sure. how do you avoid all those things? Well, when, when it comes to FERPA and HIPAA, you just have to know what you can and can't say so you don't get the institution or yourself or the student athlete in a position that you wouldn't want to be in. From a, uh, from a breaking news standpoint, when you're, when you're hiring a coach, um, I, I told all the people I was in contact with, and I said, make sure you tell your agents and make sure you tell anybody around you that not a word can be leaked about this. And if it, if it was, I assume you don't want the job. And so we were able to keep things fairly quiet on that side. And, uh, and so you just have to, and then the people you're around on a daily basis here at Arizona, we have our executive team, there's six of us on it. And I tell them, we, we, we're going to talk about very confidential things at times. There, there are HR issues, there's student-athlete issues, all those things. And we obviously can't have those leave the room. And I'm lucky. I've got a great group, and, and we trust each other. And, and they've never done anything to make me question that. It used to be that you know compliance was really a black and white issue of don't pay players, don't do things like that. But now with social media, you have people who are acting as agents on behalf of your own school right. now going out and recruiting people that maybe you didn't even want to recruit, and you're upheld to that violation. Yeah, obviously we can't have our, our fans try to recruit student athletes through social media. It's, it's, a, it's a violation. Now, I will say I haven't heard of anybody getting in trouble for it necessarily. It's a hard one to police because there's so much out there. How do you, how do you get your arms around that? Uh, but it's still not a, a allowed to do it. If you can't do it, better not do it. So the second part is the, the idea that, that violations are occurring all the time in programs. And there are violations that do occur. Uh, at Arizona, when we find out about one, we turn it in. Uh, and, and luckily, we you know, knock on wood, our, there are violations that we've turned in have been, have been secondaries, what, or what were ruled as secondaries and before the rule changes. Um, but if we, it, it, how do you keep anything secret in today's world? Uh, if somebody's exchanging cash, if somebody's giving meals, if somebody's doing something in a car, it, everybody, everybody you know, has this in their pocket, ready to go. And so you're on stage 24 hours a day. Even when you're at home, you're on stage. And so you got to make sure that you're making good decisions that come along with that so that you hopefully aren't going to have something out there that would question uh, what you do. Isn't that one of the problems that we have as the NCAA is people mistake violations as not the difference of secondary and primary, but you know, really that you're going down to any violation is the same. I mean, a logo could be two inches too long and that's a violation. Right. Yeah. There, there's a lot of rules. Dr. Emmerich is trying to simplify the process and, and what what's serious is, you know, you got, do you have somebody going 57 in the 55 zone or do you really need to make sure you're paying attention to people who are going 90? And, uh, and I, I think we're trying to get to that. It's been a challenging process, which it is anytime you're dealing with all the institutions that are part of the NCAA and you're trying to have a, a govern, governance and rules that, are, that work for Arizona that at the same time too may not work for 
Ithaca College in Ithaca, New York. And, and, but, but we still often are held to the same rules. And, and until, it's different, well, we need, until it's different, we need to be. But I think that's why you're seeing some of the discussion that's going on at the, at the national level as far as the big five conferences and some autonomy that we're hoping to, to have. So about three years ago, you gave a keynote at PACnet. And uh, it influenced me because I, okay. I sat in the audience. And usually, I skip the keynote or you know <laughs> work on my phone. I'm always but told I'm a ge- good cure for insomnia. So what, what really happened during that was your discussion was how you treat people, not just when they have the title, but when they don't have the title. And one of your best experiences was your intern ended up becoming Mitch Barnhart, who ended up becoming the athletic director at Kentucky. Yeah, well, he, he was an intern for my dad. Oh. Yeah. And I was a kid. I was, I was 14, 15 years old. And Mitch and his wife, Connie, uh, at San Diego State, my dad was working. And, and Mitch just worked his tail off, did a great job. And, and I knew from a very early age that I wanted to be an athletics director. So I would watch. And even though Mitch at the time was almost twice, probably close to twice my age, he was probably 25, 26, and I was 13 or so, and I watched him and, and really admired him a lot and still do to this day. And sure enough, I was 26 years old, he was 38, and uh, just had been named the athletics director at Oregon State University. He was able to, uh, uh, he got there and, and Oregon State had 26 straight years of losing football. And Mitch hired me as a 26-year-old associate AD partly because they couldn't afford to pay anybody. That was cheap. And, uh, and we, we really, we rolled up our sleeves. And Bob DeCarolis, who's still there, uh, we had a lot of fun. And, and uh, hired Dennis Erickson as our football coach. And he, he led us to uh, the first winning season in 26 years, or 27 years. And I was, in my lifetime, they hadn't had one, a winning season in football. And that yeah, was a lot of fun. And then Mitch went to Kentucky, and he took me with them. And then I ended up at Mississippi State, and then later became the athletics director. And, and so you never know whose path you're going to cross and the impact they can have on your life. And that can be as simple. It's amazing in the role that I'm in. You know, I, I, I take what I do very seriously. I try not to take myself that seriously. And uh, um, I think one of the things that you, you, you want to do is, is you, you can't forget how you got to where you are. And I remember when I was trying to break into college athletics, I had so many people that I, that, and I, my dad was AD at Nebraska then, and, and, and they were doing really well. They were competing for national championships in football, and, and I couldn't get anybody to return my call. And when my dad would intervene and help out, I'd get, I'd get a return call. So, you know, I, it's pretty rare where I won't meet with somebody or talk to somebody, and it's important that you, you, you can continue to be consistent with your approach and how you handle people. I always tell our staff here in the building, the most important people in Arizona athletics is a custodial crew, because if people walk into our facilities and they're not clean, then boy, we've got issues. We, what pride do you have in your, in your department and your facilities? And that sets the tone. And so that first step, our, our custodial crew has as much to do with that as anybody. So let's make sure we're treating them well, we're respecting them, we appreciate the job that they do. Are we too title focused in this industry? And- Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I was never a senior associate AD. I was never a deputy AD. I, w- I was associate AD at Mississippi State and became the AD. And, um, and I think the only people who are going to care really a whole lot about your title are the people maybe that didn't get one at, inside your own department. And then at times, uh, your family. Uh, at the end of the day, it's hard to keep them all straight. When I send an email, unless it's something official where I have to put my position down, but I just, my, my initial signature, my email signature is GB, and there's no title underneath it. I may put my email address, but um, they made me vice president here a couple of years ago, and, and they only, I think the only reason why they did is because our, our rivals have has that in their title, and I didn't care. I was appreciative that they thought about me that way, but uh, I'm kind of the same person I was before that, too. Is there a worry in the sense of trying to be a good athletic director but also not uh, curb opportunities for yourself that might come up in the future? You see some ADs who are jumping after two years. Is that right. really a good process, not only for your own career but also for the care of the No, it's not. Two, the two years is a hard deal. I, I, uh, now, and I, I must confess, I left Mississippi State after two years as AD. I wasn't looking to leave. That Arizona, Cedric Dempsey, who was former NCAA president and AD here at Arizona, and then Dr. Shelton, who was the president at the time, they recruited me to come here, and I really struggled with it because of the two years. But uh, I, you know, I think when you're looking at something, you want to look at that four-year, four to five to six to seven-year 
uh, stay from when you're when you're trying to uh, grow and, and advance in the industry. Uh, you know, I, I I was at Oregon as a young fundraiser three and a half years. I was at Oregon State four years. You know, and so you, you want to start having some of those types of stays, and that's important. And, and the reality, when I got the Arizona job, I didn't have a resume. I don't have a resume today. I I, I you know, Arizona is a destination spot, and, you, and hopefully they'll they'll put up with me for a long time here. That's my goal. But at the same time, too, you know how you get another job? You go work your tail off of the one you have, and you develop a reputation not by sticking your chest out and saying, "Look at me," by but by the results and showing that having your athletics director step up and say, "You know this, you know Joe or Jane, boy, they they do a great job. They're raising money. They're helping us with compliance. They're." Whatever their role is, whatever that role is that they're doing well, and and that will take care of itself. Because reality, we're hiring a CFO right now. Our CFO is retiring after 34 years. He's wonderful. I, I didn't know who to look to. We opened the job, but I did some recruiting and, and things like that. And I and the people that we have in as our finalists, a lot of it's because of word of mouth. It's not because of what the resume looked like. So, how do you come into a situation to where you didn't hire people? You know, but you, they have to work for you, right. and you know that some people come in and start cleaning house right away, right. or put the fear of God into people. How do you build cohesiveness to where they understand that there is, you know, your leadership, but there's also the idea that you want them here long term to be successful? Well, my philosophy is kind of unique to to, to myself, where um, I chose to come to Arizona. They didn't choose the the senior staff, the staff here didn't choose for me to come here. And so I think because they've invested their time, their resources, their family into the U of A, I need to give them a chance to see if we can work together. And if you look at our executive team, currently, until John Perrin retires, everybody that's on my executive team, which is six of us, including me, was here before I got here. And so I didn't bring any of, of my people in or anything like that. I think. First of all, one of the things I always say is that uh, you know, I kind of get on people sometimes when they say, hey, my staff, my, you know, this person works for me. It's not slavery. You know, somebody's got to make decisions. Somebody at times has to be the boss. As my friend Bracky Brett, who's the compliance guy at Mississippi State, he would say to me occasionally, he'd say, Greg, he said, sometimes the AD has got to be the AD. It's a great line. And I think about that when you have to stand up and say, something that's challenging that some people aren't going to like maybe fight fan bases won't like but that's part of being a leader you can't always do exactly what everybody wants you to do you have to do what's right for the department for the student athletes for the university and uh and so we had jim live good before me and cedric dempsey before him they all they deserve a lot of credit even dave strack who just passed away he hired john perrin who's about ready to retire and uh, they deserve a lot of credit because they brought good people to Arizona, and Arizona's a place that people like to be. You know, we've got the shot right behind here there's, of a full McHale Center, and everybody's wearing white. You know, it's, there's a lot of passion here, and that's fun to be a part of. And, and so um, I think the best athletics departments have a combination of, of people who are from the school, who could never imagine working anywhere but that school, and then some people that have been elsewhere and seeing some different things and try to bring in some different ideas and energies and having a, having, a, having a bit of a melting pot with that. At Arizona, we're a little heavier on the, I've only been in Arizona, but some of our younger position, younger people in, in some of our positions have, have been in a couple different spots and that helps give some different perspectives and different ideas. And so, but at the end of the day, our folks adapted to my expectations and, and leadership and, and I tried to set that in a tone that I thought was reasonable in a tone that I thought would allow us to get better and, and graduate our kids and follow the rules and manage our money right and represent our university in the right way and allow us to compete. And uh, they've adapted very well and I've tried to adapt to them on the same note. And uh, I'm excited about what we have ahead. How do you handle legacy in general? I mean, you'll normally get whenever you get to any school is we've always done it this way. Right. Or you have somebody who had a great legacy here and now you have to find either their replacement or their replacement's replacement, mm -hmm. but you're still dealing with that. How do you deal with that well? Well, I'm, I'm pretty steady Eddie. Um, going back to your previous question, the other thing we try to do, let's have fun. Let's have fun going to work. It's amazing, right? It is. It's a heck of a concept. And so um, 
I can probably, I, I mean, I may get more fired up about something than anything else, but I can't tell you more than one or two times in my entire career where, you know, I think people walked away saying, God, he, he is mad. I don't want to have that environment. Um, I, you know, you need to be stern and direct at times, but I want it to be where we can, you know, have some fun, tease each other a little bit in a good way, an appropriate way. Um, but let's laugh at each other. I, I laugh at myself. On Twitter, I, I make fun of myself at times. I, I, that's, that's showing humility and understanding you don't have it all figured out. And so, um, what was the next question you Legacy. said? Legacy. So, I, I just gave credit to Jim Livingood and said Dempsey for the great people that they hired and are part of it. I think it's really important for you, uh, you to understand we're all replaceable. I hope when I leave Arizona that I'm tough to replace, but I'm replaceable. And, and I think the legacy and what you do and the environment you create, um, you hope that it's a real positive one and it's lasting. But at the same time, too, you can't. You know, we've seen examples, sometimes very sad examples, where um, people, have, people have seen themselves as more important than the entire organization, the entire university, the entire business. And, and again, at the end of the day, I, I, I genuinely feel that I'm replaceable. Speaking of the, our biggest constituency at any university, it's the student body. Mm -hmm. Are you concerned with student body attendance and whether or not they're coming out to games? And what are you extremely? Yeah, yeah. What are you doing to fix that? Because as everybody is starting to see it dwindle, right. it, to be honest with you, is a scary proposition. We're not the NBA. The, these things have changed it, and in, in, in a lot of times in a poor way. Um, we're engaging them constantly through social media. We we are. You, we built a huge video board at our football stadium. We just installed a new video board here at McHale. We're trying to keep them connected and also set expectation. I do a lot of my thinking on the mor in the morning on the Stairmaster. And so one morning I was thinking about student attendance and what we can do. And you know, one thing I figured out about this job, you have to be really direct with people. I think a lot of folks have a hard time reading between the lines when you try to tease something out there that trying to get people to read between it and some do but a lot of people don't so i think cr um, constructive direct messaging can be a really good thing so i was thinking about the student section for football which we where our students are called zona zoo our student areas and i thought you know what the kids in the front row they're there they're, we got them there we don't worry about them coming late leaving early everybody behind them we worry about so i was thinking well this the the students, everybody but the front row, looks at the shirt behind, at the back of the shirt behind them. So across the back, we put Zona Zoo stays the entire game, and we're trying to set that tone and how how have them understand what a difference each of them make. And our marketing staff and Ben Shulik, who's somebody I know you know, you know they were they were talking about little their cute sayings that were kind of indirect about trying to get them to stay. And I said, got to tell them, or else they're not going to get it. And so, and that's not a that's not a uh, criticism of the students. It just you know they need to understand what the expectation is, and we, and we made progress. We're not where we need to be, but we make we're making progress. But the way we're going to make progress is directly messaging them, encouraging them, challenging them, trying to reward them for staying. And if that doesn't work, I'm not sure what's going to work. But we're gonna, we're not going to take this thing lying down. We're gonna we're gonna make sure we fight back and try to get them to stay and be a part of it. We know cell coverage is going to be a big deal. We're installing a bunch of new technology that's going to allow that to improve this coming year. As they transition to alumni, alumni's interests have changed. It used to be, hey, I want my name on a building. Mm -hmm. Now it's, I want that seat. Mm -hmm. Has that in some ways been concerning only because when you're trying to build larger projects, you're also dealing with smaller funds to do it because right. nobody's just giving up the $2 million like they used to. Well, yeah, it's, um, we've, been for, we've actually seen a good increase in the last four, four or five years on that, and that's because of the great work of our development staff. Um, and we've had some very generous donors from a philanthropic standpoint. They st the great majority of donors still, like you're talking about, want those seats, want the benefits that go along with it. We, we actually were in this room earlier today for a meeting. We're the Pac-12 basketball tournament, which will have a lot of fans there, will we'll do very well. Challenge with the good, the good thing with that is that we'll have games with other, other teams going on. The U of A chant will take over the MGM Grand, which is pretty darn cool to see two other teams out there and have our chance being, being going, going on. But the challenge with that is that we have really good, generous donors who are going to be sitting up at the top of the arena. 
and trying to find that right balance and how you handle that in the right way. And so it's something that uh, um, you, you want to have the demand exceed the supply, obviously, uh, but there's challenges that come along with that. And then the challenge down the road is, will they continue to support when they know that, hey, I'm, I'm, not, I'm gonna sit at the top of the arena if this is what I'm donating, maybe I'm just better off going through StubHub or another outlet. We don't want that, we need them. I mean, it's, it's such, our budget's 65 plus million dollars here and we use every dime of it every year. Uh, we don't have a lot of breathing room, so we need it. So as being an athletic director like being president of the United States, you can only fix so many problems, but they keep <laughs> kind of growing or? Well, I, um, you don't have po you don't have the Secret Service. Right? No, no Secret Service. <laughs> I uh, I've got my two teenage sons that kind of walk with me once in a while, and Regina. And, uh, but uh, you know, being an athletic director is, is it, it is a I love the job. I love being around the student athletes. I love watching them grow. Um, I love the competition and game days and the victories and the highs of those. You hate the lows of the of the losses. Um, you know, to watch the emotion from your fan base, you know, to get to know that you have some say in how 14,500 people can dress for a game. That's kind of cool. It's fun. It's not an ego thing. It's just fun to say, hey, that's that's making an impact. And um, and and at the same time, too, it's consuming. I uh, I mean, I uh, just the other day I had my inbox on my emails to like 12 and uh, and then I, you know, I came up here today and and I have 290 of them that I haven't responded to. And, and you, what you realize is you can't be all things to all people. Um, and one of the things, because we are an emotional buy, we're not a business buy. People aren't gonna say, well, I, you know, I can be an Arizona Wildcat for this or a Utah Ute for this amount of money or whatever it is. They're Arizona Wildcats. You know, we as professionals, we sometimes, we see, you know, we, we can be transferable. We can, you know, I used to be a Mississippi State Bulldog. I still am. I have a master's degree from there, and I'll always be a fan of the place and root for them hard. But, I, but you know, but I'm an Arizona Wildcat, and, uh, and I hope to be for a long, long time. But I also know that when our fans have something on their mind, whether it's seat location, whether it's uh, how long they have to stand in line for the bathroom, whether the popcorn was good or not, whether they like what we're putting up on the video board, whether they agree with the coach that we have, when they take the time to write, communicate, tweet, I'm not going to respond to every Twitter message, obviously, but that's important to them. And, and oftentimes that fan feels that that is the most important thing for our program, of whether we're going to succeed or not. And so you need to make sure you do your best to respond to those people and give them a, a genuine quality answer. Because they may not even like the answer you give them, but at least when you take the time to do it, they feel a lot better. And some of the best ones, I've gotten some nasty, nasty, nasty emails over the years. And I remember pretty early on thinking, you know what, I bet this person's a lot tougher behind the keyboard than they are on the phone. And I'll pick up the phone and I'll call them. And I, and I always make sure I'm, I have a professional voice, that I don't raise my voice. Every once in a while I'll get somebody that will just start ranting on the phone and I'll listen. And then I'll try to start to talk, and oftentimes they'll interrupt you, and I'll say, well, now listen, I listen to you. Can I talk? And that usually gets them to calm down a little bit. And so you, you can't be all things to all people, but you got to decide as an AD how you spend your time, what you do, because it needs to make the best impact it possibly can on your 450 student athletes, on your program, on your coaches, on your staff. And, uh, and you need to make sure you, you have people around you that are capable and strong at doing their job. So you get out of their way and let them go do it. So 10 years, 20 years in the future, what is the future AD going to look like? This is that last question that, mm. to where you look in the crystal ball and you kind of tell me, are, are we going to see an athletic director that's really parceled off, one for fundraising, one for operations, and one for whatever? I think you have to be, a, you, I'm this, this deep on all of it, all right? I can, I'm, I try to be deeper on, on academics, on compliance, uh, those are things that can really get you in trouble quickly. They also, uh, on the academic side, you have to have that as what's one of our five defining principles, graduate or student athletes. So you have to be engaged in that. You have to be engaged in fundraising. I came up through fundraising, so I spent a lot of time doing it. I enjoy it. I enjoy our donors. I, I, I love the, you know, the, the what, getting somebody to invest in what you believe in. That's, that's awesome. Um, and so what it looks like 20 years from now, I don't know. I, 
I have a belief, and let me tell you, one of the guys I most respect in this industry is Pat Hayden at USC. I think Pat has done a wonderful job. He's become a friend of mine. I really admire and respect the guy. At the same time, too, I think, I think the non-traditional AD is a tough hire at times. Um, there are so many things that you have to do in this job that it's much different than running a law firm. It's much different than, than uh, so many other leadership jobs that are out there because your, your constituent base and who you're dealing with on a daily basis is this wide. And so, I mean, I'll, I won't even touch it, but uh, 450 student athletes, the coaches that all go along with it for all the different sports, and they're all extremely driven to get that, if that they've been able to get to this level and managing them effectively. Media. Uh, I report to the president. You know, often the AD sits on the cabinet of the university. You deal with faculty. Um, you deal with uh, the legal counsel of the university, of the lawyers in general. Um, you're dealing with scheduling. You're dealing with shoe companies. You're dealing with uh, agents. Um, you're dealing with facilities and capital improvements and understanding how those things work. Um, you're, you're in the entertainment side of it, the promotion and the marketing and all those different things. You're dealing with compliance, you're dealing with the academic side of it like I talked about. No day is exactly alike. I can't tell you the last day I ever sat in my office for the entire day. It just doesn't happen. And, and so I think it, it behooves a lot of university presidents and CEOs and chancellors to understand that this is a unique deal. And I think it's important to have, and, and so you can get a guy like Pat Hayden who's doing a wonderful job at USC. And to Pat's credit, he's made sure he's surrounded himself with people that are strong in the background, in, in their background of intercollegiate athletics too. And, and I, think, uh, I think that's important to make sure we have people in our industry making decisions and are really impacting our industry that, that, that have some experience in it. Would that be like a lay president for a Catholic school? They're not going to know what it's like to be a Jesuit? Could be. I don't have any experience with that, but yeah, yeah that, that could, that's probably a pretty good example. Well, good. Hey, yeah. uh, Greg Barron, thank you very yeah, much Troy, for coming on the podcast. Thanks very much. Yes, sir. Bear down. Uh, yeah, bear down. Yeah. I'm Troy Kirby with the Dow Sports Video Podcast with uh, Greg Byrne.